And to be on with Henry, who basically was in Bozeman, I had no idea a day after the conference, but due to uh, family issues, when I say issues and you know, travel issues and everything else, he showed up for the perfect time for us to have him on tonight. You know, and at the conference, Joe and Doug, people were coming up and saying, when are you going to get Henry on? When are you going to get Henry on? And to get Henry sometimes depends on where he is in the world. But by the grace of God, the Lord so graciously dropped him into uh, uh, Bozeman now. So we're both going to be able to uh, share with everybody. And Henry is uh, unique in all the world. I've known him for uh, decades, as in plural. But the thing that's fascinating, this will be, I believe, this, this 50th year, and he can speak to that, of walking the nations of the world, remitting their sin and taking dominion over the principalities and powers that have bound so many nations and kept them under demonic control. Uh, we're going to ask Henry, and I ask Henry because, Doug and Joe, as you know, when people are at the conference, the Whitestone Conference, uh, they said, will you ask Henry to address the uh, Carnarvon Castle? Everyone's uh, seen now, if you would, where they would dismiss Henry's vision of the Russians attacking America and the failure of America to even uh, be able to give any response in light of the last two months I would say this is Henry's uh, entree to his vision in uh, in real time, where it used to be prophetic the day would come. Now where the day is here. So, Henry, God bless you. Please take it away, and uh, thank you so much for coming on tonight. Part one will be Henry and taking it. And I told Henry, I said, Henry, wherever you want to go on rabbit tra- trails, I, I basically initiate them, so I'll follow them. So we got a chuckle out of that. Henry, blessings. Thank you for coming on. Uh, uh, here we go. Been a, an interesting time. Are we ready? Yeah, we're, you're we on got now, you. sir. Okay. All right. Uh, yes, we are definitely facing interesting times. Uh, that Kamarthan uh, vision that I had, uh, I want to reiterate and go back a little bit before the vision uh, to help people to understand the setting. I had uh, been walking and praying the country of Wales, of Great Britain, from uh, the 25th of November, and uh, walking around the country of Wales, and I was in Bangor, Northern Wales, which is the next city down from Carmarthen, and uh, it was very cold out, the uh, snow was blowing in my face. I had been walking systematically the streets, and uh, I came to a place where I would have to walk quite a distance down to cross a bridge and come back and go back and walk the next street because it emptied out into a little creek-like, the dwelling. And uh, so I thought, well, I'll just walk on up and won't go across the bridge. I'll just cross the creek. It's frozen anyhow. And I stepped into that creek, and uh, it wasn't frozen enough. I took a few steps, and next thing I knew, I'm down up to my knees. Well, thank God that's all the deeper it was. But with it about 17 degrees outside, and you got that North Sea wind coming in and snow blowing in your face, it's not a comfortable time uh, to be wet from your knees down. And uh, it didn't take long for my pant legs to be frozen, and I could hardly feel my feet. And uh, in that environment, I had a few few streets left to walk of Bangor, Northern Wales. When the Lord spoke to me, and he asked me this question, and I feel this is so significant as a basis of the Lord testing me before he gave me that Russian invasion vision called the Kamarthan vision. He asked me, are you willing to lay your wife and your children on the altar and never see them again this side of heaven. I don't know if any of you out there have ever been asked a question like that, especially when you have a family the size of mine and all, and I dearly love my family, and had already been away from my family a considerable amount in the life of their being in the time after they were birthed and all, and I had four-year-old twin daughters when I left, and one son that was three years old, looking out the window uh, of the plane there, of the airport. And uh, uh, I told them, if I see you, that was back when you could, 1986, you could still go to the uh, disembarking point where they get on the ramp to go on the plane. 
And uh, I told my, my children, now, if I see you, I'll wave my ticket jacket over the window because I had a window seat. And if you see that white ticket jacket waving over that window, it's Daddy saying goodbye. And so as the Pan American Airlines pulled out, backing out from the loading berth and pulling away, I was waving that, and my twin-year-old daughters were kind of, twin daughters were kind of cupping their hands, looking out the window there at the airport, and they, they, I knew when they saw me, the instant they saw me, they ran, pulling the mama's skirt, and were pointing, and I knew they saw me, and I watched them, and their excitement, and then, of course, the tears begin to flow. That was a difficult time to be gone. I would be gone Thanksgiving, Christmas, and uh, New Year's, and into January, and, uh, so you see, I would already be sacrificing time away from my family, and I, I believe the theme of this uh, this session tonight is going to kind of revert back again and again to a realm like this of our commitment and our dedication to the Lord Jesus Christ. I think it's very important that in this day and hour that we're living in, that that is our number one priority and that we arrange our priorities according to that, our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I'll go back now to walking those streets of Bangor. I could not say yes. I'm, I'm willing to lay them on the altar because I honestly, I honestly felt that that was asking too much. And if, if the Lord did that, I would be offended at him. And so I finished walking those streets, caught the, the coach, as they call it, the bus, to Camarthen and went to a family, uh, to a visitor center, found a family-type uh, lodging, which is always best if you're staying bed and breakfast or something like that, or hotels. Uh, get a family lodging, then you know where you are and you know you're in a good one. But uh, I got that secured through the visitor center and stopped by a fish and chip shop, and I uh, got my fish and chips in my piece of newspaper, the way they delivered it back in those days, uh, served it in newspaper, and was eating that as I was walking toward the, the lodging. And here were a group of young people all bundled up and uh, talking and laughing, and it just took me right back to my teenagers at home. Because, you see, we had 13 children, seven sons, six daughters. And I just lost my appetite, threw my fish and chips in the dustbin or the trash can, and headed on up to my lodging, got as warm a shower as I could take, and then got a little hotter and hotter until my uh, my body began to thaw out, and uh, crawled into the covers and pulled the covers over my head and went to sleep about 8 o'clock that night, which was earlier than I normally would, but... I didn't want to face the world. I didn't want to face anything. I didn't want to talk to the Lord. I normally would always read the Word and pray before I go to sleep, but I didn't want to talk to the Lord because I knew what He'd ask me, and I fell off into a sleep, woke up at 4 o'clock the next morning, and went out of bed on my knees, began to pray, and the Lord said to me, I want your answer before you leave the room this morning. And I began to weep, burying my face in the pillow so I wouldn't wake up people in the rooms around me because I was sobbing quite loudly, crying out, Lord, I'm afraid. I'm afraid if I say yes and uh, you take my wife and my children, uh, I'm afraid I will be offended at you because I feel like it's enough of a sacrifice to be away from them as much as I am, especially in this season. Forgive me, but I am afraid. I, I love you. I love you too much to be offended at you, and I don't want to be offended, but I'm afraid. And he began to show me my life before I was married and after married with each of the children and the different miracles, and I won't go into all the miracles that God has performed in trying to raise 13 children, just simply to give you this simple, quick little outline of incidents to help you to understand what he was saying to me. He began to show me these events. He began to show me and take me right back to them. Uh, when my son, uh, my firstborn son, was three years old, and I had 
accidentally. He had went out the door. I thought he'd hide it on for the car, and uh, <laughs> he uh, he. He, I didn't know it, but he came around behind me and had his little fingers, his little finger, in the open of the back solid core door, the hard core door. And I went to close the door, and he screamed. I looked, and his finger was in. I pushed the door back open. He lifted his hand toward me. His little finger was hanging from just about between the first and second joint, by just a little piece of skin. I had literally sheared that finger off in the back of that door. And I had been practicing something that I had heard Maxwell White teach me in Toronto, Canada, about four or five years before. And uh, it was applying the blood of Jesus over your household as the priest of your home. And I had been doing that, and nothing seemed to have changed. It didn't seem as though it was working. And that morning in prayer, I was asking the Lord, is this really a good teaching? I'm not seeing anything happen. Well, you ever been set up by God? (laughs) I felt like I was set up. And uh, as my little boy is screaming and lifts his little hand up, and that little finger is hanging by just a piece of skin, I cup my hands under his little hand and under that piece of little finger that's hanging there, and I hear my ears hear me saying, the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus. And all of a sudden as I'm saying that, all fear and all anxiety and horrible feeling on my own of what I had done to my son left, and faith took hold. And immediately, as that faith took hold of my hands cupped under his little hand and blood dripping into my my cup of my hand from his little hand as he rested his wrist on my my thumb, faith come into me, and I said, in the name of Jesus, you finger, you go back on no ill effects. And right before my eyes, that little finger just snapped back up and filled back up. It was flattered and could be. It filled back up, and the blood was still dripping from his little elbow. And he looked at me and smiled with the tears still running down his cheeks, and he says, Daddy, it's okay. Jesus put it back on. Well, now that was the first thing the Lord showed me. And he said, Could you have put that little finger back on? Well, how did that make me feel? I tell you, people, it made me feel so humble. And then he began to take me systematically, event after event, even through 1984 when I had died in the automobile accident, was dead for over a half an hour, a minimum of a half an hour, witnesses said, with no no heartbeat, no breathing. Our 15-year-old daughter pointed at my dead body and rebuked death off of me. Each of these incidents, the Lord said to me, could you have brought life back into your body? And each time as he showed me these incidents and took me back, I felt smaller and smaller and smaller and humbler and humbler. And I had to cry out and say, Lord, my my tears changed of fear of being offended at the Lord, of tears of repentance for my thinking that I was the provider, I was the protector of my, my wife and my children. And the whole scenario changed. And so, broken and weeping and repenting, then the presence of God come over me so sweet and so precious. And I felt, okay, Lord, if you're taking them, it's okay. I know you. I trust you. Your wisdom is always most sovereign and perfect. And so I leave that with you. And I got up and, and uh, began to dress and went down for breakfast. And uh, then come back up, got myself dressed and ready for going out into the cold and began walking. I came down. I always made it a point to go down to the lowest point of a village or city that I'm walking, if there's a river, a lake, or the ocean. Well, it happened to be the the bay that goes up into Liverpool there. And uh, so I headed down to put my foot in the water. That's something I always do, just touch the water and systematically walk the streets to the highest point over the village or city. And so as I was walking down, I went by the Camarthen Castle, 
and the drawbridge. The drawbridge was down, and the Lord spoke to me and said, I want you to go in there. So I went up on the drawbridge, and there was a lady in there, and she was just setting up to accept the fee, you know, for for taking and going in to, to view it. And uh, she let me pay it, and so I was the first person in there while they were still kind of setting up in the day. And I went and walked around through the grounds and saw the big slate uh, uh, platform, big circular platform, and on that was a black slate uh, throne-like, and all around this were pictures of the coronation of Charles as the Prince of Wales. And uh, I thought, well, wow, that's interesting. And I'm praying, Lord, what is this significant about? What are you saying to me? And uh, so then he said to me, go up on that tower. It was the tallest of many towers. It, uh, the Camarthen Castle is the, of the British Isles, geographically, is the largest uh, land marine base defense uh, one of the 11th century and 12th century. And uh, I didn't know at that time it was called the Eagle Tower. But I went into that room, and here were five stories of war museums that you could view. And I thought it was very interesting as I came to the war of the, the colonies uh, seeking their independence from Great Britain. And here was the admiral's very letter on display back to his majesty about this small uprising in the colonies. And he said, I will take care of this in a fortnight, which means two weeks, and be setting sail back to his majesty's service. Well, there was a note under that which said, uh, obviously he didn't make it back in a fortnight, uh, that was the War of Independence, which became the United States of America. So you can see how God set me up here. I was totally ignorant of this this museum, totally ignorant of all this with where Charles was coronated and all that. <clears throat> and uh, that was really significant to me. So as I headed on up, I got up on the top of the tower and was trying to just put all of that behind me. And uh, I was looking off toward the North Sea to the island of Anglesey. And my conversation with the Lord was, do you want me to cross that bridge after I finish every street of Camarthen and go and pray the island of Anglesey? And that was my whole thinking. I wasn't thinking any more about the War Museum or any of that. When all of a sudden, instantly, I was caught up into the heavens where I could see the whole earth as a globe. And I could see up above Norway, up into Archangel and Murmansk, which I didn't know was Archangel and Murmansk at that time. But I saw this massive armada, armada of ships, of warships coming out of there. And they were coming down and they were building a, a massive armada uh, of, of invasion and they went clear down around the Horn of Africa, and they came up to the Pacific side of the United States. And then I saw all of these towers that I thought were radio towers shooting up out of the land all across America. Now, you've got to remember, this is December 14, 1986. And I thought they were radio towers. And then I looked down and parked our Russian submarines along our eastern coast and the, the northwest coast of the Pacific, they are parked so close, it's like I could see like Eagle Vision, and I could see that these submarines were parked with their noses so close to our shores that the light color of our beach sand was right on their noses. And such alarm came over me. And all of a sudden, I see dotted lines coming out from what I thought were radio towers, I think it's a combination now that I see across America of radio and cell phone towers because that's the kind of towers they were. And uh, they're just like a forest across America compared to a spot of towers here and there with radio stations and TV stations. And I see the dotted lines going out from these towers all over. 
And all of a sudden, the dotted line sprinkled to the ground like dust. And I realize, all of a sudden, I, this, this terrible horror comes over me. And I cried out and I said, oh no, they won't even know what hit them, which means our, our communications were shut down. And then I looked back to this submarine right off from the coast of New York City. And out of that submarine, I see this missile come flying right over the top of New York City. I watched it explode, and I watched New York City turn to dust. It literally is like it turned to dust like, like the Twin Towers did. They just were dissolved. The giant buildings were dissolved into a mass of fire and smoke. The whole city, not a tower was left, not a building. It just leveled everything. And so then I looked clear across the United States because at that time, in 1986, I lived in Portland, Oregon. And so I was concerned about my family. And I saw Portland, but then I looked up to the right, and I would say Seattle-Bellevue area. I saw another explosion like that, and that area disappeared and then I look down and see another explosion toward San Francisco, one between uh, uh, the area of about L.A. and San Diego. Those three, three of them hit in that state. And then I look down toward Florida, and between Tampa and Miami, Florida, I see another one. Now, I don't know if you realize it, but that between Tampa and Miami is where all of our Middle East command center is for all military operations in the Middle East. That's where I saw that when I found this out since from a, a, a general who told me, and he, he asked me if I could show him exactly on a map where that was, and he said, all right, you've seen it right over our command center for the Middle East. So then I saw one, of course, up toward New York, that New York City in a rubble. And all of a sudden, I was standing back on the Eagle Tower in Carnarvon, looking down on the village below. And I, I was in shock, like, after seeing this. And so I'm looking down at the village, expecting sirens to go off, expecting some kind of commotion going on in this, this city. Everything was business as usual. So I turn and look out to the bay where there were some British warships, battleships, and a couple destroyers. Uh, and I'm watching them, and there's no one flying out there in their cars out to the port. Uh, there are no sirens going off. And I think, well, Lord, if this is not happening right now, then what will be the sign of it and of its time? That was my exact words. And here's what the Lord spoke to me. He said, When Russia opens her gates and lets the masses go, the free world will occupy themselves with housing, transporting, transporting housing, and caring for the masses, will begin crying peace and safety, and that's when it will happen. So I ask you people, 1997, Glasno, or 87, 1987, February of 87, the word came out that Prime Minister Thatcher had just been over with Gorbachev, and there had been an agreement made, and, on, and it would be called Glasnost Perestroika, and which means uh, restructuring and openness, and a plan to let Tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands leave Russia that want to leave from the communist area. And uh, Jews could go back and they would release these people that want to leave. So there it was. They will open their doors, their gates, and let some masses go. Okay, that's history. We've seen it now. We've seen it. We've got a lot of Russians over here and uh, all over America. And Israel, every week there are flights of Israelis that can prove they have Jewish blood that are going to Israel. So we're seeing this, this part fulfilled. We're seeing the part fulfilled of the cell phone towers all across America. And then in Desert Storm, when senior President Bush said, 
went on radio there in February. I think it was 1990 or 91. I get them mixed up sometimes. But he said, let the storm begin. And that night, we exploded a device over Iraq that knocked out their solid state, which means their communication systems. And Jeremiah 50 and 51 talks about them, one post running from the other to let the king know that his city or his nation is, it, is, is under siege, which means it's going to knock out the communication systems, and they're going to have to literally go back to ancient times of footmen running to communicate between their defense stations. That was fulfilled. Also in Jeremiah 50, 51, it says, make bright the arrows. What did we do? We shot cruise missiles that were laser guided. And as they said at that time, they could, they could hit a mailbox. They were that accurate. So we made bright the missiles and all and desert storm took place. And, uh, that was a fulfillment of a prophecy that I gave. When people ask me what will be the scenario, I said we will have a conflict in the Middle East, and then it will increase. It will go greater and greater into the Middle East, and then we will go over into North Korea and Taiwan. And I believed that that would be the progression that would take place. Well, where are we in that? We're into our third conflict uh, in the Middle East. It started with a little country there, I'm trying to think of the name of it, that uh, Saddam Hussein invited, Kuwait. And then we went in to liberate Kuwait and we went up to the edge of Baghdad, which in, in Jeremiah says they will go up to one side and draw back. We literally fulfilled that under senior president bush then under his son we went in and we conquered baghdad and baghdad was fallen and so we have seen the fulfillment of isaiah 50 51 there and the prophecy that jeremiah wrote and put it on a scroll a copper scroll sent his representative his footman his messenger, to go and to read it over the Euphrates River and then bind it to a stone and throw it into the river. And so here we have, as an update of where we are, if you look at all of this, in that prophecy and in Revelation, it says the kings of the east will go across dry shod. So we know that right now we're living in a time when that Euphrates River that flows right through Baghdad could become dry. And it says they will go across the Euphrates dry shod. Why? There are five massive hydroelectric dams in Turkey. And if they they hold all the waters, the headwaters of the Euphrates River, and if they shut those dams off, then that Euphrates River dries up. And so we saw that happen. We saw, the Lord said in that Jeremiah 50, 51, I will dry up her sea. Well, the sea would be the Persian Gulf. How could it dry up? We hit Iraq with 22,000 bombing missions. It shook the earth so violently and all, that it dried up her springs. It affected the aquifer over Iraq. If you go back, you'll find out in history, Iraq even threatened to bring a lawsuit against America for messing up its, its aquifer, and we sent our military in there to drill new wells and go deeper and everything to get water for the Iraqis. What about drying up the sea? They put so many distillation plants along that Persian Gulf there that it raised the pH in the salt water so high that the fish and all began dying. And the National Geographic, in about 19, oh, early 90s, did a, a special on the, the Persian Gulf, calling it the Stinking Pond. You can check all this out. There won't be time to go into all the details and give you documentation, but I'm giving you traceability of what I'm saying of the fulfillment of the day that we're living in. Jeremiah 50:51 is being set in motion for the kings of the east to come over to come down to Israel and to fight 
and to fulfill what we know as the Battle of Armageddon, where the blood will flow to a horse's bridle. So where are we on this? Let's look at it with Russia right now. I stated back there that I believe Russia, yes, is going to open her gates, and Russia is going to, I, I stated this in my, my presentation called Russian Invasion, the Russian, I, the Russian Invasion. And uh, I said, I believe that Russia is going to open her gates. And because it is a communist nation, it is a parasite nation. What do I mean by that? It prospers by conquering and dividing the spoil and the economy of the nations conquered. We've had this and we have China in the same way. They've prospered by continuously using all their resources. Right now they're going down into Nepal and China is and continue on down into the Philippines and all. And we know they're already uh, in South America in many places and as well as Russia. So we know this is going on. So this is, this is an up-to-date where we are prophetically according to the Word of God. And so Russia now, I believe, is getting ready to close its doors again, and we know that by what it's doing over there right now in its aggression and wanting to take back some of these countries that it has given liberty to. And I, I said it would do that. And our dear Mr. Putin uh, is kind of laughing at the United States and the embargoes that were we're putting on Russia. It isn't bothering them. Their industry's been built up. Their, their, their system has been built up and their economy and everything. They're doing very well. And, of course, I don't have to say any more about China. China's doing very well. And uh, so we see this scenario right now. And uh, where are we in the realm of the United States? They will begin letting down their weapons, crying peace and safety. Well, under Senior Bush, I had documentation, and you could have read a lot of this in U.S. News and World Report and Time Magazine and all. We kept shutting down more and more and more military bases all across the heart of the United States. 126, the last I had read there, under Senior President Bush. And then uh, more under Clinton and uh, more under younger Bush. And uh, now, if you're, you're paying attention, uh, I was just up in the state of Washington last fall, and uh, the, the large base up there in the state of Washington is going to be ten times, probably by now, is already ten times bigger than it is Fort Lewis and that area there because our president is emptying out our bases from the heart of the country even more. And the article said he is moving our defense system to our coastal areas. Now, people, if you understand warfare, with cruise missiles and the type of firepower we have today, tell me it is wisdom to move your defense force where that first strike strike capability can wipe out our defense system. I talked to a, a gentleman just a few days ago, just before I left Iowa, who is from Strategic Command outside of Bellevue, Nebraska. And uh, he's there in that base and, and, and in the military. And I said to him, I said, what's happening at Strategic Command? And he said, well, uh, we keep sizing down and sizing down by the thousands. And he said, many of us don't even know if we're going to be there much longer. It's being sized down so rapidly. And much of our systems of defense and all are being shut down because we don't think we need them anymore. So I would say people that we are definitely in a time right now militarily and if you listen to Hagman and Hagman and uh, this kind of programs, I don't need to e educate you in this in any way. But all I'm doing is just trying to give to you uh, a basic scenario of my personal observation scripturally and uh, the visions that I've had and uh, to bring you up to date in that. Uh, 
another vision now that's very interesting that I had. Uh, remember, the Lord had me go to Carnarvon Castle, and I, I look at Prince Charles. Here he's coronated as the Prince of, uh, Prince of Wales. Well, then I had the Prince Charles vision. And uh, all of these visions are mentioned in the book called The Visions of a Prayer Walker, Crosswise. But uh, the Prince Charles vision is a very interesting vision. Uh, that vision, to me, tells me an awfully lot of where we are right now as well. Uh, I'm going to go to that on page 34 here of the book uh, because I want to tell you the date that I had it. It was in 1978. So you see this vision I had while I lived in Portland, Oregon, or Hillsboro, Oregon. And uh, in this vision, uh, the Lord told me to get in my van and to drive Highway 26 and to go with my family, load my wife and children up, and take Highway 26 up to Mount Hood. Now, Mount Hood, Highway 26 goes up and goes around Mount Hood to what is called Government Camp, and there are ski lodges up there and all, and uh, during the WPA days, they built the Mount Hood, the, the lodge up there on the top. Timberline Lodge. But the Highway 26, uh, you can spur off and go up to Timberline Lodge, a 7,000 foot. Or you go and follow 26 on around. And he said, the, in the vision, the angel said to me to go so many miles to the 10th past government camp. And there will be a pull off and take your wife and your children. Take your wife and your children and go. Sorry about that. That's my phone. Forgot to turn it down. <laughs> uh, and go five miles to the tenth. And uh, <laughs> distracted me. <laughs> uh, there will be a pull off and there will be a switchback trail going down into a canyon. There will go down with your family, lead the way, and go down that trail, and there will be a person to meet you when you get down there. So I did. Five miles to the tent, there it was, a pull-off. The children were watching, and there's a pull-off. And when we got down in the base there, here's an English butler dressed in the full tuxedo and everything with a towel under his arm, and his very proper British language, he says, Now then, you've arrived. Follow me. And so we follow him across this clearing, and I look down a grade, and there are five sets of chairs, uh, five rows of chairs. And I see these, these two men standing down there, a senator and a general. And we go down that grade, and I meet the senator, whom I guess I knew, and the butler introduces me to the general, and the general says, yes, he says, you're the family that we've heard about. Sit down here, we have, we have a message. And so with that, uh, we sit down, the family, whole family sits down, and the butler pulls out from under the towel on his arm, he pulls out a two-way radio and begins talking on it, walking back up the grade where the level place was that we came down to the switchbacks. And as he comes back up there, a double-blade helicopter, egg beater as they call them, comes over carrying a blue, what looked like a construction office, but I learned later it's more like the UN-type colors, uh, uh, of office, and it carefully lowered it down onto that level place and released the cable that was holding it. And the butler walked up and opened the door of this little office, and out comes Prince Charles. Prince Charles was dressed in like an African uh, arid country with the, 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 the light tan cutoffs between the hip and the knees and the short sleeve khaki-type shirt, and the large-rimmed 
hat like you would wear on a on a, a hunting excursion in Africa. And he's coming down the grade with the butler, and as he's arriving, we all stand, and I'm looking at him, and I recognize him as Prince Charles, but his face is puffy and red, and I look at him, and I thought, he has been weeping terribly, mourning. And he comes up, and they introduce me to him, and he says, yes. He says, you're the, the man and the family. That's your family there? I said, yes. He says, and the family I've heard about. He said, please be seated and take note. I have a message for you. And so we all sit down. With that, he said a couple of words to this general, four-star general, and they walked up on the stage as a little bitty stage with one microphone. And as they walked upon the stage, they talked a little bit again, and the general went back to the back of the stage and sat in the only chair that was on the back of the stage. With that, Prince Charles turned to the microphone, and he said these words, Thank you for coming today. I have a message for you. Now, all of a sudden, I realized all the chairs of the five rows of, five rows of chairs behind us were full of people. I don't know who they were, but... I noticed all these people were sitting there. I didn't see them come in. They were empty when we crested the hill, but they had all filled up. So maybe for time, I don't know why the Lord just showed them all filled up. But he said, I have a message for you. Please take heed. I must inform you that your nation is at war and that you have a battle to fight. And the saddest thing is you must fight it without God. And with that, the general jumped to his feet, come over to the left, stepped off the little platform, came down ground level around in front of Prince Charles, looking up at him on the platform with his hands on his hips, very sarcastically said, we know our nation is at war and we know we have a battle to fight. But we didn't know God had anything to do with it. And with that, Charles lifted his hand, pointing with his finger, and come down with a sweeping motion right down between the eyes of the general, saying, And, sir, that is your mistake. And with that, Charles and the general began arguing why God did or didn't have anything to do with it. We were all watching this when all of a sudden I saw a motion off to my left, not very far from all of us sitting. And I looked, and here was a massive desert frog. A desert frog, these desert toads are big, big, fat, green toads. But this one was so big, if he stuck his tongue out, He could have lapped up Charles and the general and all of us in those five rows of chairs very easily with one lick. And what I had seen, now remember, this is in 1978 I saw this. Now think about Charles dressed in desert attire, desert warfare. What have we been involved in now these last years, two decades or more, more than two decades? Desert warfare, haven't we? All of our gear is is desert colored, our camouflage material, everything is desert warfare. And Great Britain has lost a a fair amount of troops as well in this conflict. Well, I'm watching this giant frog. Nobody, Charles and the general, don't seem to see it. I look back at the people behind me and my family. They're all focused on Charles and the general, why God does or doesn't have anything to do with it. And... As I'm looking at this, this frog, all of a sudden, what I had seen, it had lifted its head, and when a frog makes a croaking sound, the air sac under his chin begins to fill up, and it turned from a dark green to a very light yellow. And as it filled up this big air sac under his chin, terror came over me. And I said, Dear God... If that frog opens its mouth and makes the croaking sound, I knew something would come out of its mouth. We're all dead. 
And about that time, it opened its mouth, and out of its mouth came a white vapor. It enveloped Charles and the general and was coming our way. When all of a sudden the vision changed, I was caught up into the heavens above what looked like Trafalgar Square in London. I didn't know what square it was till I went over to London and went into Trafalgar Square, and I froze looking at that. It was my vision of 1978. And in this vision was all around the square were buildings of representation of all different kinds of uh, everything from commerce to education to, to medicine to industry, all this to government. All these buildings were around the square that represented the, the, the great British Empire. And uh, all of these people come running out of all these buildings in their occupational garbs. even saw a, a, a welder with his helmet. I saw nurses with their nurse uniforms and and doctors and all with their stethoscopes and different people and professors with their books in their hands. Like I, the Lord was showing me, it represented the whole wholeness of the British Empire. And I thought, what is going on? And they're all running out and they're all looking up in one direction. And all of a sudden, they all start pointing up and they're laughing. And they're saying, we're not afraid of you. You can't hurt us. You don't have any power. Your power is all gone. And I was caught up above to see what they were looking at, and here was a massive army overshadowing them, and all kinds of... I've described different weapons that I saw, and I've had military people describe those weapons. They are present-day, state-of-the-art weapons, including laser systems. Wow. And... All of it. I mean, I, I don't know what they were. I, I saw the weapons. I saw the laser systems fire. I think they knocked out satellites. I think they knocked out the communication satellites is what they were doing and firing these massive bolts of lightning into the heavens. And then I saw this general standing there in command with his black, bushy hair-like he looked a lot like Alexander Lebed when uh, Senior Bush and Gorbachev sat side by side and they crossed the new Russian flag with the United States flag. He stood, Alexander Lebed stood right behind Gorbachev in that, that front page of Time magazine or whatever it was, uh, which news and week or time. And uh, I looked at him in that when that magazine came out. So that looks like the general that lifted his fist. I saw fury come into his face as these people were mocking this massive army, saying, we're not afraid of you. You can't hurt us. And I saw his fists all of a sudden come up, and he yelled out the words as his blood vessels in his neck. I saw him that close, swelled out and puffed out, and he said, present arms, aim, fire. And as he said this, this massive army began firing on the people in Trafalgar Square. Now, the way they were dressed was very strange. They had long black hair, the army did. They had these strange-looking googie eyes and snoots like almost like a horse. And their chests looked ribbed like a locust. I described it that, and uh, an officer in chemical warfare said, you have perfectly described our chemical warfare gear, Russia's, I'm sorry, Russia's chemical warfare gear. And uh, so I had that described way back there in 79 or 80, whatever it was, when we were, Russia was hitting Afghanistan and we were going in and arming the people that are now beating on us, the Taliban and all them. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Uh, <clears throat> anyhow, uh, he said, you perfectly describe Russian chemical warfare uniforms that the soldiers had. Well, then, of course, in the, in the uh, book of Revelation, it gives a description of frogs, and it describes a description of people, men with long hair and teeth and destructive weapons in their hands and all. Uh, so there we have that. And as they were firing on these people in the square, terror, total terror came over these people, 
because they did not, truly, they did not believe that they would be attacked. They did not believe mm-hmm. that they would actually fire on them. It, you could see the total surprise, and they were running all over, and they were just shooting them like, like ducks, you know, in the water. And I could hear the bullets hitting them. And that was the end of the vision. Well, people think with what I'm saying here. I, I'm not a gloom and doomer, but I want to tell you something. The scenario of these things that I've seen and all, where are we in this scenario? If, if, if it doesn't stir you to pray, I've been in Korea, I've been in Japan, I've been in China, and I've met Christians in those countries, and believe it or not, they are spending hours praying for the United States of America. They know we are in serious trouble. The church of those countries knows we are in very, very serious trouble. So think about this. I I hope it has helped you in this first almost an hour to kind of bring you to an an understanding a little bit of the the scenario and the timetable that we're in. Uh, You know, hey, Henry, let me me share something that will echo this, just as uh, people didn't get the full impact of... uh, when the U.S. state-of-the-art missile cruiser was in the Black Sea in a Russian Su-27 old-technology aircraft, but new technology electronic countermeasures completely nullified the fire control and navigation system on a billion-dollar warship. In other words, oh. rendered it totally inoperative. Now I want to read you something, and this will you know, probably echo what you just said in the last 55 minutes because it's critical people understand. This is from Hawk, who's the guy that took over my old radio program, Steve. Just to let you know, per sources who watch all aircraft worldwide, earlier this week there was an air traffic control takeout at the San Diego airport, similar to the LAX takedown where the Russian aircraft flew by and Russian ships were off the coast of California. We're talking, Henry, in the last two weeks. And just prior to that, the U.K. airport all had aircraft, their tra- air traffic control down a few weeks back. So the San Diego takedown was similar to those. And then after that, where it was not really reported nationally, but where commercial air traffic was being turned away to other airports or was uh, was placed in a large stack circling. In other words, they kept it in the air. Mm-hmm. After that, mm-hmm. after this, and now listen to this, in the last 48 hours, Marine Corps' Harrier jet out of Yuma, it crashed, loud explosions per witnesses, and then crashed. In other words, they heard explosions in the aircraft before it then crashed. And last night off San Diego, San Diego, an F-18 Hornet crashed into ocean while attempting a night landing on a carrier, which basically those guys can do. Somebody, uh-huh. and probably Ivan Svetsnats, took them out either with energy weapons or was able to hack their computers. The Harrier went down near El Centro, California, where, as you recall last week, it broke on the air that the Friday before that, an Antonov-124 Russian transport came from Russia, landed in Alaska, and then flew to El Centro, California. I said mm-hmm. to pick up Russians who did the fires around San Diego and Camp Pendleton, but they could have loaded as well. They could have offloaded energy weapons to take down the air traffic system and also possibly cause those two jets to crash ties directly into the russians as henry is discussing right now so henry what you oh. saw those years ago this is going on right now and i am told by people in the know that there was such a late burning of the midnight oil in the pentagon simply because what the russians demonstrated to the u.s navy is that the navy is sitting ducks if this is true, and I mean all these events are true, but if there is a rhyme or a reason, then our not only deciding to move all of our uh, weapons to the coast, as by the way, the United States military has been taken apart literally piece by piece, and with the attempt to move all of uh, our military assets, which be defending the homeland, moving them to Europe, and at the same time bringing Russians and Chinese troops and foreign NATO troops into this country to put the country down, meaning the revolution that they are going to uh, initiate, it appears that there is more at foot here. And I think the critical situation is this. I made a statement four years ago, and I read the prophecy on the air where the Lord said, I'm against the Pentagon and their desire to kill my people, to make war on my people. 
So it mm. appears, Henry, that just as they try and fight a war without God, which your second vision, the one you shared, was it's literally in play. The United States will not be able to stand, and I made the statement that our systems would fail, our communications would fail, our weapon systems would fail, and they are all happening. I mean, we're talking right now a two-week illustration of what you just shared. Oh, Lord. And do you know, Steve and, and uh, Joe and Doug and all of you, uh, I just talked to a uh, uh, a person uh, in California, this pastor, and he was all upset. He said, I don't know what's going on here, Henry. Do you understand what's going on? My people, I'm talking people that have been my most solid people in my church, and I'm hearing other pastors are having this happen. God has been telling them, get out, get out of California by the end of May. He says, do you understand what's going on, Henry? And I said, brother, it scares me what you're saying. He says, Henry, these are not fly-by-night people. These are my most solid people. They're, they're literally quitting high-pay, high-dollar jobs, putting high, beautiful big homes up for sale, moving movie vans, getting out of California.